I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. On this episode of Q&A, University of Texas at Austin professor Sarah Brain, who has a new book, Predict and Surveil. She shares her research on big data collection by police departments and its effect on law enforcement. Sarah Brain, your new book, Predict and Surveil, seems like it's very well timed for a national debate on policing, but you tell readers that you've been working on this project for about a decade. How did you get started in this interest in big data and the police? Well, when I was a PhD student um, at Princeton back in, I think it was 2012, this is sort of when the start of enthusiasm over big data was happening. So people were saying that big data is transforming everything from finance to sports to uh, journalism, marketing, insurance, education. But no one was really yet working on how big data was or was not transforming the criminal justice system. And I had sort of had this longstanding interest in the criminal justice system. And I started to ask, you know, how are the police, courts, corrections, leveraging things like predictive algorithms and how is it sort of changing their daily operations? Um, So I quickly realized that there wasn't actually ironically very good data on police use of big data. And that's when I decided to um, pursue an ethnographic study um, on that question. We'll have uh, lots of time to explore the details, but what is the conclusion that you came to after you spent this amount of time investigating the topic? The conclusion is is basically that instead of thinking about data as some sort of um, objective or fundamentally unbiased tool. I think that it's better to think about data as situated in social systems and organizations. Data is kind of like a form of capital, something that some people have more or less of. It can be used for different purposes. And it's something that has an increasing amount of value in organizations. So it can be used to achieve different kinds of organizational goals. And so the book really sort of disabuses folks of the notion that data is this objective and, and unbiased force that, that can, can fix all of these problems that have existed um, for decades, if not centuries. So in, in effect, it's a, a cautionary tale for people who are looking to the use of data to solve some of the policing problems the country is discussing. Very much so. You write that the intersection of big data and the overgrown U.S. criminal justice system motivates my work. So first of all, define exactly what big data is. You talk about three V's, volume, velocity, variety. What is big data? So big data, the three V's of big data um, typically refers to volume, meaning simply that there's a lot of it. There's a lot of different pieces of data. The second V has to do with variety. So meaning the data comes from a whole range of disparate institutional sources. For example, the police have always collected their own data, their own crime data, for example. But increasingly, the police are using information from a whole range of institutional sources, like private data brokers, um, corrections data, social media data. So that's the variety part of it. Um, And then velocity has to do with processing speed and sometimes storage capacity is kind of involved in that as well. And that basically means that you can run analyses on these vast troves of data that previously would have taken days or weeks, but with increasing computing power, um, we can run them almost instantaneously and and, um, often remotely as well. And why do you come to the conclusion that the U.S. criminal justice system is overgrown? Well, sort of no matter how you measure it, the United States criminal justice system is unprecedented um, in size and scope, both in um, international comparative perspective, looking at peer nations, but also historically. So, for example, if we look at the percentage um, or the number of people behind bars in the U.S., it's been basically on this monotonic rise since the early 1970s. We may be seeing a bit of a turnaround now. And I think that um, also if we look at federal expenditures directed towards local law enforcement agencies um, or the, the um, number of cops on the street, just the United States is really without peer in terms of the size and scope of its criminal justice system. And so sometimes scholars talk about this as a phenomenon of mass incarceration, which has to do with not just the reach of who's behind bars, but also the families, communities, neighborhoods um, that are heavily surveilled and policed as well. One statistic that you give in your book is that 70 million Americans have a record on file with criminal justice agencies. That's out of a population of 330 million Americans. Is that statistic a surprising one compared to other Western nations? 
It is definitely very surprising. And it's also pretty surprising to the audiences that I typically present to as well. I've had many folks in, in, in audiences try and correct me um, on that saying, you know, you must have an extra zero in there. Um, and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I think still there's a tendency sometimes to think about involvement in the criminal justice system as this sort of unusual or uncommon experience. Whereas increasingly, particularly for certain demographic groups, such as those with lower levels of educational attainment um, or racial minorities, for example, involvement in the criminal justice system is like a modal life experience. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it, it is a very surprising statistic, particularly when you look um, in comparison to other countries with similar crime rates. To uh, write this book, to do this research, you spent a lot of time in the field. Uh, tell me about that experience. Well, basically, um, as I mentioned, you know, there just isn't very much data on police use of big data. And so what that really called for was what we call ethnographic field work, which is essentially talking to people and watching people and writing about them as they go about their daily lives. And so I quickly realized, you know, I would need to get um, access to a police department. And I selected the LAPD, not because it's a modal or average police department in any way. It's not. It's, it's very large, well-funded. Um, but I selected it specifically for those reasons that it was sort of on the forefront of police use of data analytics. And therefore, I thought might kind of forecast some broader trends that may shape other smaller police departments in coming years. And so my field work involved um, observations and interviews with sworn officers and civilian employees in different area and specialized divisions of the LAPD. So things like um, information technology division, um, records and identification, um, robbery, homicide, fugitive warrants. I also did um, went on some ride alongs, um, did some observations at JRIC, which is the Joint Regional Intelligence Center or Fusion Center in Southern California. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Fusion Centers are basically these multidisciplinary, multi-agency surveillance organizations funded by the federal government, um, largely in the wake of 9-11, which was sort of viewed as a case of information sharing failure in the intelligence community. Um, and then I also did some interviews with folks who um, work at the key technology companies that um, design some of the analytics software that the LAPD uses. So those include things like Palantir or Predpol, for example. Were, was your presence within the police department welcome for the most part? Um, that's an interesting question. So uh, I would say that I was able to obtain uh, a, a really great degree of access, um, unprecedented in some ways, but there was a lot of variation in how I was received, I think. So, and this is one of the things that this kind of ethnographic research has really exposed is that there, there's a lot of variation or heterogeneity within police departments. So for those individuals who were um, very proud of how the department was using data, they considered themselves to be sort of on the vanguard um, leaders in their field. They were excited to have me there and to show me all of the new technological tools that they had. But at the same time, you know, historically, police have not been particularly receptive to researchers or to, to journalists um, spending time with them. So there was a certain guardedness or, or, or resistance in other spaces where, you know, they were concerned that I was going to do a hit piece on them, that, you know, I was going to just sort of like come in, do a gotcha story and leave. And I think that the, the resistance to my presence sort of declined the longer I spent in the field because I was able to build some of those relationships and start to share my findings um, with the police themselves. But there was often also a lot of confusion about who I was, to be honest, in the field, because basically police departments are very hierarchical organizations. So if somebody higher up in the organization vouched for my presence, say a captain said to his sergeant, you know, yeah, she's here, it's fine. Then the sergeants and the patrol officers and everything would sort of find that to be okay or tolerable. But they often confused who I was. You know, they would say, instead of saying I was a sociologist from Princeton, they'd be like, oh, she's a psychologist from Harvard or a senior from Stanford and all of this kind of thing. So there was definitely some confusion about my presence in the field as well, particularly on Ride Along. It was important in selecting LAPD for it to be emblematic, as you call it, of other police departments. But how many police departments around the United States are actually using software and big data collection? So unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that question. And I think that that's a fundamental problem when we're talking 
about, um, you know, we're having these nationwide conversations about what policing should and should not look like. Um, so there isn't any centralized data on this type of thing. There are some surveys, some national surveys, such as the Law Enforcement Management and Administration Survey, I think it's called. Um, but they're pretty out of date. It's voluntary compliance. Um, and a lot of the time, the budgetary allocations to these kinds of advanced technologies are pretty ambiguous. You can't necessarily always tell from a police budget what amount of money is spent on this kind of thing. So. I think that you know it would probably fall somewhere in the 70% range from what I have read um, with the departments that are not using these kinds of tools largely being quite small police departments. The United States, another thing that's really unique about their criminal justice system is that we have this really federated system of policing where police, oh, there's a lot of police departments that are extremely small, you know, under 20 officers and they lack the training, funding infrastructure to, to onboard these kinds of technologies. One other question about your preparation and research into this. You founded something called the Texas Pre- Prison Education Initiative. What is it and how did it inform your work on this topic? Well, the Texas Prison Education Initiative is basically just a group of um, volunteer professors, graduate students, postdocs and undergrads who volunteer teach college classes in prisons. So. When I was in graduate school, actually around the same time that I started this project, I started volunteer teaching um, in state prisons in New Jersey, just volunteer teaching college classes. And when I moved to Texas, which has one of the largest prison populations in the country, I figured that the university here would similarly have um, some sort of prison ed program that I would just sort of continue volunteering with. For me, it's sort of important um, because sort of that is my skill set um, around being an educator. And also, you know, I do this research on the criminal justice system. And so it seems unwise to have, you know, no exposure to um, folks who, whose lives are really on the line and who are involved in the system itself. And so there wasn't a pr- prison education program um, at UT at the time. And so along with a fellow graduate student, uh, Lindsay Bang, we uh, founded the Texas Prison Education Initiative And now we offer college credit classes to, um, well, it's on pause due to COVID, but um, to about 150 folks. We have over 60 volunteer instructors from departments all across campus, um, everything from sociology to to physics, English, math. um, And the courses are all uh, for credit and available without cost to the students. How did that work inform your conclusions on big data and policing? Well, one of the things um, that came up that's actually informing some of my future research is that a lot of the time um, there's a lack of knowledge or information among the folks who are incarcerated about the particulars of their case, specifically the phase of police investigation. So, you know, I would have students say things to me like, my lawyer had no idea, my, my defense attorney had no idea the means by which I came under suspicion. Like they had no idea why the cops just happened to be sitting outside my house that day. Um, And I think that one of the things about big data policing is that it's largely invisible, right? When we have a whole bunch of cops on the street, that's a very visible police presence that you can understand and you can feel. But big data policing can be invisible. It's hard to exactly put your finger on. And what actually is going on in police investigative procedures is largely a black box. And this, I think, may serve to exacerbate um, pre-existing inequalities in the system. You mentioned that there was a big uptick following 9-11. That's also when people began to see that police departments around the country were bringing surplus military equipment into Mm -hmm. uh, their use deployment. Uh, That that decision is now being reexamined both at the state and national level. However, you write the creep of military software into police operations is largely overlooked. Why is that? Well, I think in particular it's it is precisely because uh, it is so invisible. So uh, as you said, there has been increased attention about the militarization of policing, you know, how police departments are getting mil- surplus military kit, um, you know, small local police departments have tanks and this kind of thing. Um, and I think that military software is this largely untold part of the story where a lot of different techniques and platforms and algorithms that were initially designed for military application are being imported into local policing. And I think that the reason that we don't know that much about it is because, again, it's largely invisible. You know, you can see a tank rolling down the street at, a, at you know, the Pumpkin Festival in New Hampshire, but 
you can't necessarily see that they're using predictive algorithms in the same way. So is uh, police departments have used data, even if it was manually collected for a really long, long time. So is the issue here that rather than reactive policing, solving a crime that has happened, it is the use of data to predict predict where crime might happen and how that is used uh, and whether or not it's used equally? Is that really the nub of the question for society? I think that that is one of the nubs of the question is that we've had this shift from largely reactive to proactive policing. But I think another really key transformation that's also occurring is, as you said, the, the police have long been collecting their own data and information, but that's on people that they have contact with. And what's happening now in the digital age is that the police are increasingly collecting information on all these folks who have no direct criminal justice contact. And part of that has to do with this variety component of the three Vs of big data, that they're increasingly purchasing information from privately collected companies. They're using tools like automatic license plate readers, where you don't have to get get pulled over by the police in order for your data to be put into their system, for example. And so that kind of information is also being used um, in the predictive modeling, for example. Tell me a little bit more about the two companies that you mentioned. The first is Palantir Technologies. Uh, What does it do for police departments? So Palantir Technologies, they actually just went public um, in in, uh, September of this year. So there's a little bit more information available on them now than ever before. But back when I started this field work, very few people had actually heard of of them. Um, And essentially, they have a platform that is called um, Palantir Gotham where law enforcement agencies like the LAPD, but other types of clients as well, um, are able to aggregate all of these disparate sources of information and visualize them in certain ways. So for example, the police might have, you know, their own crime data, but you can build out these networks where somebody in the center of the network might have direct police contact. They would be stopped by the police, for example. But then there's this secondary surveillance network. So let's say I've been stopped by the LAPD, but you never have. But I've called you on a phone. So your phone number is now associated with it. Or I, you know, was parked outside of your house. Or it has information on who I'm dating or who my siblings are or where I work. And so you have radiating out this sort of secondary surveillance network um, of individuals who don't need to have any law enforcement contact. And so that's one way that you can sort of use Palantir to to visualize different sources of data. But it's also used for investigations. So for example, there was one instance in which there was this, um, there was some copper wire theft going on in the city. And what they were able to do is basically draw a radius in Palantir in sort of the mapping function, and identify all of the vehicles through automatic license plate reading that were in that radius between, say, midnight and 5 a.m. when they knew the copper wire theft had occurred and identify or narrow it down to like three cars that might have been involved in that particular crime. So basically, it's this very powerful data integration and and surveillance tool that can yield insights that previously might have taken, you know, hundreds of detectives on a particular case or you know, weeks or months, and and you can, of of this sort of shoe leather policing, and you can use data to shorten that down to to mere minutes. Which people listening will say, that sounds like a good thing. Uses less Mm -hmm. of police resources and a lot less, as you call it, shoe leather time. So where's the problem? So I think the issue lies in in the sense that in order for this system to work perfectly, we have to assume infallibility of the state, that the state never makes mistakes and that the inferences that one will draw about, you know, why you were in a particular place at a given time are unbiased and without any error. And that everybody entering the data, there's still a very human side of data collection, right? This is not all automated, that everybody who enters the information will do so with bi- without bias or error or prejudice. And that's just not borne out um, in ethnographic field work, for example, we have, you know, tons of information that suggests that the data inputted into these predictive policing systems, for example, is as much a function of law enforcement practices um, as it is actual offending rates. And we also have a lot of evidence that error is disproportionately distributed. So, for example, there's a study out of Michigan indicating that about se- that black folks are about seven times more likely to be wrongly convicted of murder than whites. And in order to be a hit, if you think about DNA databases, for example, you have to be in a database in the first place. And so I think that part of the challenge 
with big data policing is that so much of it is invisible and it's hard to put your finger on exactly where the error comes in. So in other words, the software systems that are being incorporated in the process support existing police practices rather than a, a, a rethinking of how, how could we better police. Yes, I think that's very well stated, even though it sort of runs counter to a lot of the Silicon Valley rhetoric about these systems being, you know, totally disruptive and transformative. I think to a large extent, they do actually reproduce existing police practices, but under this sort of veneer um, of objectivity. I want to show our audience a spot, a commercial that we found. It's uh, from 2012 from IBM about predictive policing. Let's let's watch. I used to think my job was all about arrests, chasing bad guys. Now I see my work differently. We analyze crime data, spot patterns, and figure out where to send patrols. It's helped some U.S. cities cut serious crime by up to 30% by stopping it before it happens. Let's build a smarter planet. So, Sarah Brain, uh, how does reliance on public companies and private vendors impact citizens' rights? Um, Well, I think that the uh, increased reliance on the private sector in public policing um, is fundamentally undermining some avenues for accountability um, within public agencies. Um, and, And this holds true in policing, but also as you follow particular cases into the criminal justice system. Risk assessments are used, yes, for predictive policing, but also in pretrial determinations, um, in sentencing, um, even in um, community supervision decisions as well. And if you're unable to sort of say why somebody has a high risk score in a predictive policing algorithm, for example, um, or why somebody has a high risk score in terms of pretrial detention and therefore you need to detain them until their trial date, for example, that really undermines what we call due process, the idea that everybody has a right to a fair trial. There's a certain amount of transparency required in order to have fairness of process and procedure. And so when you have this like increased role of the private sector in public policing, they can hide behind, for example, trade secrecy agreements saying, you know, we're not gonna disclose the specifics of our algorithm because it's a trade secret and that type of thing. Um, non-disclosure agreements there even if you submit um, public records requests sometimes it's really hard to determine even exactly what private companies are doing for public police agencies Um, and and this lack of transparency can fundamentally um, undermine accountability and and I think um, due process ultimately. To learn a little bit more about how predictive policing works I want to to spend a little time on that but you mentioned the software called PredPol that is a routinely used by a, a, quite a number of, of big city police departments. How does it work? So PredPol is um, a, a place-based predictive policing algorithm. So essentially, um, it takes three different types of input, past, place, type, and time of crime, weighting more recent crimes more heavily in the algorithm. And that training data is used to predict where crime is likely to occur in the future. And then so it basically produces these 500 square foot boxes about the size of like an intersection. Um, and then officers at the beginning of their shift are instructed to do data driven deployment, basically to go to these predictive boxes, check in and out um, and hopefully deter or or um, intercept crime. Um, and so that's sort of the the fundamental nature of, of PredPol, which is, as you mentioned, one of the largest predictive policing softwares. There's other Others um, that use uh, a much wider range of input data as their training data, PredPol's model is what's called quite a parsimonious model. It just has those three types of inputs. Um, But other predictive policing algorithms can use a a whole range of of data from seasonality to demographic composition of an area to um, lots of different things, sort of the kitchen sink model. So you write in your book that uh, either person-based or place-based predictions uh, show the potential to reduce inequality, but as currently used, increases inequality while appearing to be objective. In other words, a Trojan horse. So you referenced earlier chronic offender strategies. That's person-based predictive. How do they work and how how could they be uh, applied unequally? So within the department, um, they actually tried using the, the place-based predictive policing in order to predict violent crime after 
they had started using it to, to predict um, property crime and found that it wasn't very predictive. It wasn't working very well. So they decided that they were focusing on the wrong unit of analysis, whereas with place based predictive policing, you know, they should and property crime. They should focus on location, perhaps with violent crime, they should focus on the person. And so they adopted a strategy um, within the LAPD called Operation Laser. And within that strategy, essentially, they created a um, rank ordered list of individuals according to their risk scores. And the risk scores were calculated by giving folks five points if they were on parole or probation, um, five points for a violent um, arrest or for a prior arrest with a handgun, um, five points for their criminal history, and five points for a gang affiliation. Then individuals were given one point for every police contact. So every time the police stopped them, they would get an additional point added to their score. Then folks are rank ordered according to those scores and chronic offender bulletins, which are these one page informational bulletins where it says, you know, your name, um, different addresses, people you're associated with, if you have any AKs or gang aliases gang aliases, that type of thing, um, all of your previous police contacts. And essentially police are told, you know, go out and find these guys, stop these guys again, because that serves two functions. One is this ongoing intelligence gathering. You know, you can see where people are, who they're with, this type of thing. And the, the second is to keep their risk scores high so as to further justify continually stopping them um, every day. And this sort of can create um, a recursive loop or, or like a hidden feedback loop by which individuals, you know, have a high point score, they're stopped, that stop increases their point score, thus increasing the probability they're going to get stopped in the future. And what's key here is that this becomes decoupled from actual criminal offending. So this is, these people are not wanted, there's no outstanding warrant for their arrest or anything. But they have these risk scores that keep getting higher and higher because of ongoing police contact. So it's a very um, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy or, or self-justifying cycle that can happen. So as a sociologist, what happens to uh, people with regular interactions of being stopped uh, when they haven't committed a crime? Well, there's a whole host of research um, on different things, sometimes called legal cynicism, um, sometimes in the procedural justice literature. The idea basically being that you're more likely to be law abiding if you find the criminal justice system to be fair. And for folks who are constantly getting stopped, even if they are not committing any crimes, this erodes the legitimacy um, of the system for them and makes them think that, well, research actually suggests it makes them think that it's not just the police that are unfair, but the state, the government more broadly. And it can create this sort of alienation um, and, and skepticism as well. Um, and in the sense that some of this can, can start to constitute harassment, you know, there were some folks who were getting stopped upwards of four times a day. And this can be really disruptive um, in your life, particularly if you're trying to sort of get on the straight and narrow and you're driving your kid around and you get stopped by the cops four times a day. It can be highly disruptive um, to your life. Uh, we have a, a news clip. from This is from 2016. It's from New York City and, and it's NBC4 in New York. But it is about their program, which is called CompStat. Is that a, a very much different from the kinds of programs that are used by the LAPD? It's basically just a precursor to predictive policing is what I would say CompStat is. CompStat is this management system basically where you take different crime data um, and, and make different precinct commanders responsible for driving the metrics down, for reducing crime um, in particular areas. And so it's largely a precursor to predictive policing. And in fact, it, it, it was Bill Bratton who was heading up the, the NYPD and implemented CompStat at the time that actually introduced predictive policing to the LAPD years later. Well, let's get a sense of how it works in action by watching this news story. The 4 this day has to answer for a big jump in robberies and assaults. All right, Carlos, you know why you're up there. A lot of things going on in the 4 Crime is uh, definitely not heading in the right direction. This is CompStat in front of 200 NYPD commanders Inspector Carlos Valdez explains what's going right. We are also up in arresting those index crimes. And to face a grilling about ongoing problems, big and small. How are you doing with robbery warrants? This is basic stuff here. Yeah. If you have a robbery issue, everybody up there at that podium needs to be tuned in. I'm not sure if I'm hearing that. It is every Monday we analyze, just like always, we analyze where the robberies are occurring, what time they're occurring, and try to pinpoint those locations. We're up uh, 73, almost 74% in rob arrest, but that's not the goal here. 
All right. The goal here is, is crime prevention. Sarah Brain, what are you hearing here as you see a public meeting with with these division uh, chiefs being questioned in a very public setting about their crime statistics in their areas? I mean, basically, I think what we're hearing is we're hearing uh, managerial oversight play out. So um, uh, managers are asking precinct commanders, you know, why are your crime rates going up in this division? I see when I'm looking at these particular metrics, you may have more arrests. But really, the thing that I care about is crime rates going down. Why aren't crime rates going down? It's essentially data being used as an accountability mechanism and as a performance metric for evaluating police officers performance. What's the reaction of the law enforcement people that you found in using these software systems? Do they think it's a plus for the work they do? So this is one of the um, kind of unexpected parts of my field work, I guess I would say. And so when I went into the research, I um, was ambivalent about how law enforcement might receive some of these new technological tools. You know, on the one hand, a lot of media portrayals, um, um, uh, portray law enforcement like Minority Report, having this voracious appetite for new technology, new data that increases their power, increasing, increases their sur- surveillance capacity. Um, on the other hand, uh, work and employment scholars or labor scholars would probably predict that there would be resistance to these tools. Um, precisely uh, as you sort of mentioned here, that people feel like there's this entrenchment of managerial control, more oversight, that kind of thing that plays out. And so actually, on my very first ride along, I got sort of um, a little bit of insight into how this may be playing out in the LAPD. So we pulled up to um, this this vacant home. We, we were responding to a 911 call um, about a possible break in there. And as we pulled up, the officer typed that he was code six in, the, in his laptop computer, basically meaning the unit had arrived at this location. And in that moment, I sort of got a little concerned because, you know, I thought to myself, I had selected the LAPD specifically because they were so technologically advanced. Why is this guy having to manually input the the location of his vehicle? And so I asked him, you know, is there not some sort of way of of them centrally knowing where all of the cars are? And he said, oh, yeah, every vehicle is actually equipped with an AVL or automatic vehicle locator that pings the location of the vehicle every five seconds, but they're not turned on because of resistance from the police officers union. And so it was in that moment that, you know, it really crystallized for me that data and technology are are not some sort of like inevitable um, or, or unbiased or objective tool. They're something that increases the power of some while decreasing the power of others. And so when this technology was introduced into the workplace in the context of policing in this case, you had a real division in how people reacted to it. So people in managerial roles, um, roles with more oversight, for example, they tended to embrace these tools because it allowed them to know, you know, not just where their officers say that they go, but where they actually go. And sort of it, it permitted this entrenchment of managerial control. So they tended to embrace it. Whereas the more line officers, patrol officers, for example, tended to resist it because they viewed it as this entrenchment of managerial oversight, but also importantly, um, kind of a, it it played a de-skilling role as well, meaning it like eroded their professional autonomy. They would say things to me like, you know, I've been out here for 20 years pushing the black and white. I know where crime is at. I don't need an algorithm to tell me where to go. Also, what is an algorithm? Anyway, so there was a lot of sort of skepticism about the the importance or the the role and the opacity of algorithms as well. When I read that in your book about uh, the uh, policing in their minds being a craft, not a science, uh, I I was thinking about the debates that happened again after 9-11 with the increased use of data to predict terrorism and uh, less reliance on people on the ground and uh, really in knowing the communities that they were observing. It sounds like there's a a real parallel situation going on here. Yes, there very much is. And also my fieldwork was sort of taking place in the context as well of increased immigration enforcement. And so that was, which local law enforcement is is not typically responsible for or is not technically responsible for. Um, But there was basically just like growing mistrust in communities, particularly communities of color, about what the police were doing and why they were collecting information on them and what they were going to do and how they were going to intervene in their lives. And, you know, I think that that most of the officers that I talked to were aware that still the most important tool in their kit is people on the ground being willing to talk to them and share information with them. At the end of the day, that's largely how you populate 
these databases, for example. Um, but the extent to which it may be sort of eroding that kind of trust, particularly when you're rolling out new surveillance tools and technologies under the noses of civilians who have not approved them on the front end, that can serve to exacerbate, um, I think, a pre-existing distrust that, that already existed in many communities. In this debate we're having over policing, uh, the people are increasingly looking to data about police operations rather than the data we've been talking about looking at citizens uh, to put mm-hmm. uh, some uh, some uh, f- feedback into the system. Body cams on police officers. We've seen a lot of those after the, the um, shooting of a number of black citizens this year. Uh, pr- uh, logs that are computerized and analyzed so they can know mm-hmm. how many stops are happening, that sort of thing. So... Uh, you said that there's some resistance to the police being policed, in other words. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're feeling that there are inequities in that side of it and bringing their own equipment along, like their own cell phones and their own to yeah. record things on their own. Talk about that aspect, too, which is that the data is actually uh, backfiring for some of the police in the process. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting phenomenon that's occurring um, that you mentioned, Susan, where one of the um, affordances of big data policing is that it leaves digital trails and digital trails are susceptible to oversight. And so increasingly data on where the police go, what they're doing is being recorded and then can be used. Largely, it's being used just within police departments right now. So um, for managerial oversight, for accountability, that type of thing. But there are calls for the public or external agencies to have more access to this data in order to be able to hold police departments accountable, for example, like access to body cam footage, for example. Um, And and yeah, I witnessed these like fascinating practical strategies of resistance from officers themselves, ranging from like um, foot dragging to obfuscation to, as you mentioned, creating their own data that they have ownership of and, and, and think Um, uh, will tell a truer or more favorable story for them. So for example, there's a whole bunch of automated recording systems that exist um, in police cars. For example, as soon as you put someone in the back seat, you have this DIC, this digital in-car video basically that starts recording that kind of thing. But some police officers that I went on ride-alongs with, they had their own personal recorders in their pockets that they would turn on and off when they wanted because they didn't trust the system, for example. They didn't trust that it would, you know, exonerate them and and, um, um, prove that they hadn't done anything wrong. So some of them were actually creating more data um, in in order to sort of protect themselves. Others were were, um, just avoiding the data collection mechanisms altogether. So I saw officers sometimes using their cell phones to call each other or text each other because they didn't wanna go through dispatch because dispatch um, has a record and dispatch records can be audited, for example. And then one of the sort of, more crude, I guess, instances I saw was there was this rash of antenna malfunction going on in in one of the bureaus I was doing research in. And it turns off that actually the it turns out that the officers were actually just ripping the antenna off their cars to prevent their supervisors from hearing um, what they were saying in the field. So that suggests that the officers don't trust the data that's being collected about them. No, there was a lot of mistrust, a lot, a lot, a lot of mistrust. Yes. In, in 2015, after Michael Brown's shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, a task force was established with DOJ and the, the Obama administration to look at policing. Let's listen to President Obama in 2015 talking about the work of that task force. Over the past year, we've come to see more clearly than ever the frustration in many communities of color and the feeling that our laws can be applied unevenly. After Ferguson, I said that we have to face these issues squarely. I convened a task force on community policing. In May, this task force, made up of police officers, activists, and academics, proposed 59 recommendations. Everything from how we can make better use of data and technology to how we train police officers. Dozens of police departments are now sharing more data with the public, including on citations, stops, and searches and shootings involving law enforcement. The Justice Department has begun pilot programs to help police use body cameras and collect data on the use of force. This fall, the department will award more than $160 million in grants to support law enforcement and community organizations that are working to improve policing. Sarah Brain, what came of that effort? Well, basically, um, that was 2015. As soon as Trump was elected, he disbanded the task force. So it doesn't 
um, exist anymore. Um, that said, you know, many of the community members, grassroots organizers, academics, researchers, and policymakers to a certain extent that were interested in this kind of thing have continued this work just without explicit federal government um, financial support. And so, for example, you have this this phenomenon of, of what some call stat activists or stat activism, where, um, as Obama mentioned, you know, we actually didn't have any sort of federal count of the number of people killed by police each year, for example. And now a number of um, nonprofits have started aggregating that kind of information in order to have this first step of shedding light or transparency on particular police practices in order to ultimately um, improve accountability and the administration of justice. And then again, this year, in the wake of George Floyd and other killings in the United States, uh, there's been a, a, another big effort on police reform. And I want to show a clip from June 16th of this year. This is Georgia Congressman, Republican Congressman Bob Barr, talking about what Democrats and Republicans can come together on in the 2020 version of police reform debate. Let's listen. Certainly on the issue of militarization and putting limits and scaling back the uh, provision of military equipment to police is certainly something that I think both sides uh, could and should agree on. I think improving the monies that are made available federally to support local police for uh, in, in increased and superior training is very, very important. I think uh, providing money for much better data keeping, record keeping for use of force is extremely important. So these are some of the areas, you know, training, data keeping, uh, demilitarization that are uh, included both in Republican proposals and Democrat that hopefully will provide a basis for a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation. Some of the more complex issues, as I mentioned earlier, such as the one size fits all standard that the Democrats are proposing for use of force, I don't think are workable. And in fact, that legislation passed the House and had bipartisan votes on it, but died in the Senate. When uh, Congressman Barr is talking about data keeping, that's really just one side of the equation that we've been discussing. The records uh, of, that are uh, keeping track of the police and their movements. Is the legislation, as it's been debated in Washington, dealing with the issue you raise, which is increasing amount of surveillance uh, by private systems being incorporated into police record keeping. Is anyone talking about that? Um, largely not yet. There are potentially, um, there is potentially a, a, a bill that currently has some bipartisan support um, that is essentially limiting the scope of predictive policing tools. Um, and, and that, you know, by definition, because many of the predictive policing softwares are, are developed um, privately um, and are privately provided, that would sort of start to do that. But, but no, I think that largely these conversations are, are, are missing the, this point of, of the increased um, privatization or private presence um, within public policing. And, and in many ways, it's sort of, you know, the private sector is not subject to the same types of um, transparency requirements, appellate checks, all of these kinds of things that public agencies are subject to. Um, so sometimes it is really falling outside of the scope of some of these bipartisan efforts to increase um, uh, uh, fairness or accountability in policing. And from a constitutional perspective, this all comes under the umbrella of our Fourth Amendment rights to unreasonable search and seizure. Have there been important cases before the Supreme Court that have looked at some of these questions? They are starting to come um, into the Supreme Court. So, so as you mentioned, you know, of course, the Fourth Amendment has to do with protecting us from unreasonable uh, search and seizure. And one of the key issues at hand here is what constitutes a search? What does a search actually look like? That's really different today in the digital age than it was 10, 20, 50 or 100 years ago. So previously, you know, it used to be that the police cannot come into your home without cause, rummage through your drawers, this kind of thing. But what's sort of the digital equivalent of rummaging through drawers? You know, is it is it OK if I look up your name in a whole host of different databases? Would that constitute a search? increasingly policing is suspicionless and is programmatic and is data-based rather than like really visual, really visceral, invasive um, 
immediately present, it's sort of sometimes difficult to even understand or know the ways in which you are being surveilled. So some of the relevant cases um, that have come up, I mean, Carpenter probably would be the main one, and that has to do with um, um, cell site location information. Um, um, whether the law enforcement needs a warrant to access that kind of thing. But also there are these like much more um, seemingly boring or benign cases. One of my favorites has to do with tire chalking, the idea that um, um, can, can you mark, can the state, can an attendant basically mark on your tire where you were in order to prevent meter feeding, like just driving your car and feeding the meter again? Um, and I think that that also has to do with issues of locational privacy and that type of thing as well. So you tell us that society and uh, is at an inflection point, and certainly we are because we're having these big debates about the role of policing in, in our communities. You're urging us to think big about both of the opportunities and consequences, the promises and the perils of data collection and deployment. So what are you calling for, and how, how should, how sh- should de- society debate these issues, and in what forum? Yeah, I think that, you know, particularly the events uh, uh, of this summer, you know, George Floyd's killing, they've really broadened the scope of what we're talking about when we're talking about changes in policing. Instead of, you know, focusing primarily on reform, there's conversations about um, defunding or shrinking or abolishing the police, you know, fundamentally changing the institution um, of the police and what they do. And data is really um, being proffered in many ways as sort of this, like, panacea or silver bullet with many of these issues. So for example, in the defunding debate, let's say that we're trying to defund the police and cut costs. Well, people say that data can be used to allocate resources more efficiently, or let's reduce, you know, racial bias in officer decision making. Let's automate it or want to reduce, you know, the the categorical suspicion of of young black males and and, um, more accurately predict crimes why don't we try predictive algorithms? And so I think that, you know, we need to be cautious here when using data, uh, when when we're trying to solve social problems with technological solutions. And so the first thing that I would really suggest in moving forward is is that we take a moment to, to stop, to pause, and really invert the order of operations of what's been going on in the past 10 or so years. So I think we need to stop the pattern of law enforcement rolling out new technology without any front end community buy in or independent evaluation of its efficacy. You know, ironically, a lot of these federally funded initiatives are for evidence based policing and they occur before we have any evidence of their efficacy. Um, but that brings me to sort of like a second recommendation, which is I think we need to broaden the scope of metrics of success. We need to redefine successful policing. As sort of came up in that CompStat meeting, for example, there's been a preoccupation with crime rates. That makes sense. But I think there's a whole host of other things that we need to be paying attention to as well when we think about the rollout of data, for example. So is there an increase in cases cleared by arrest? Is there a decrease in the number of stops without arrest? Is there um, an a, a increase or decrease in racial disparities in stops without arrest or proportion of false arrests, for example? Getting at sort of those legitimacy um, issues, racial equality issues um, that really lie at the heart of, of policing today and, and actually historically always have. Um, I would also suggest that there's something sort of going on here when we're, we're talking about transforming policing where You know, if the only thing that you have is a hammer, everything kind of looks like a nail. And so in the policing context, we are using data to direct largely punitive interventions. And so I think if we're able to to say within the United States, you know, the police are being called to respond to to many things that they do not need to be present for and might be better addressed by professionals or community members trained in a different way. If we're able to use data to direct not just punitive resources, but also non-punitive resources, we may be able to reduce some of the inequalities as they're playing out. So there's a a movie in 2002 uh, that Steven Spielberg directed called Minority Report, and it earns five citations in your book here. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to show people the trailer from that. And uh, and we have about less than 10 minutes left. Uh, to sort of sum this all up about the inflection point that society is at. Let's watch that trailer. 
Okay, Jad, what's coming? Double homicide, one male, one female. Killer's male, white, 40s. Set up a perimeter and tell them we're en route. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks. Give the man his hand. The future can be seen. All we have to run on are the images that they produce. We see what they see. There hasn't been a murder in six years. There's nothing wrong with the system. It is perfect. I agree. Murder can be stopped. Tell me exactly what it is you're looking for. Flaws. Did we get any false positives? We are arresting individuals who have broken no law. But they will. The fact that you prevent it from happening doesn't change the fact that it was going to happen. The system can't be wrong. Run! Wait! Can you say something, Chief? So how far from reality is that 2002 science fiction movie? So we're kind of far from from that. A, a lot of there's the reason that it comes up so much in the book is not really because I'm trying to analogize predictive policing to Minority Report, but because it's really what the public presumption of what is going on is. Whenever I give a talk, people are like, oh, this is like Minority Report, this kind of thing. So people are not being arrested for pre-crime, for example. However, I do think that what's happening is data is being used to create sort of categories and scores of suspiciousness of people. And law enforcement treats folks differently depending on how suspicious they are or they aren't, or how suspicious a particular area is, or how, how at risk of crime a particular area is. You know, one of the most consequential law enforcement decisions is where to go and look for crime. And we are very clearly using predictive policing to predict certain types of crime, street crime. We're not predict using predictive policing to predict financial crime. You know, the hot spots are not in New York on Wall Street, for example. These are very social decisions about which crimes we want to prioritize, and it tends to be what's called street crime as opposed to like white collar crime. And so I think that, you know, we are kind of far from it in some ways, but a lot of the time what I would do in my interviews is I, I would ask my um, interviewees to imagine or to fantasize where they would be in five or 10 years in terms of police use of data and technology. And that's really where a lot of the minority report stuff came up. You know, they would say things like, oh, you know, I could imagine if I was, driving down the street, you know, going to serve somebody an arrest warrant and and the windshield of my vehicle would be like Google Glass where I would see, you know, there's a, a registered firearm in this house. There's a sex offender in this house. There's somebody with an outstanding warrant in this house. And so they would just be sort of bombarded with all of this information. This is sort of the the minority report world that, you know, while it hasn't really played out yet, I do think that it's these these public imaginaries can be really powerful, particularly in moments like right now, when we're trying to reimagine um, and, and reinvent policing. As, as we close out here, there are, uh, I'd like to raise some objections that people listening to you might be saying. For example, crime rates are down. Technology is obviously making me safer. How would you respond to that? Well, I mean, I think that the, the the causal relationship actually between enforcement practices or police use of technology being one of those things and crime rates is is very heavily contested. There's a whole bunch of things that are responsible for crime rates. And, and we can look to the 1990s as sort of and early 2000s as, as one of the um, um, emblematic cases of this. Policing is just one of many things that impacts crime rates. And so I think it's way too simplistic a story to say, you know, the introduction of these new technologies causally impacts crime going down. It could be a whole host of other things as well, from economic conditions to change in the drug trade, this kind of thing as well. Another objection could be, look, I'm a law abiding citizen. Uh, why should I be concerned about data collection? Yeah, absolutely. The sort of if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear um, type logic. Well, one of the, the responses I would say to that is that, first of all, again, it sort of relies on the assumption of an infallible state. So you have to be fully confident that all police officers, all lawyers, all state actors are never going to make a mistake and never make any unfair decisions about you because you're not going to be able to push back on any of it because you're not going to know why these things occurred because it's all sort of shroud in, the, in these opaque algorithms and that kind of thing. And then secondly would be, you know, this idea of do we believe that there is any inherent value in privacy? So right now, Susan, I'm more than happy to be having this discussion with you. But if you ask me to say, you know, my social security number on air, even though I fully trust you as a person, I wouldn't want to do that. I think that there is value in me having that information 
be private. And that is very much being eroded as well. So you tell us that the law has not kept up with the advance of technology. Uh, as you be, embark on your book tour and begin talking about this more widely, what is the w- one thing you'd like to see happen as a result of, of the work you've been doing? I mean, as a researcher, I, I really see my role as, as shedding light on these, yeah, technological processes, but also really social processes of how the police are using big data. I would really just like to, through my work, pull back the veil, um, reduce the amount of secrecy so that different people can do with it what they will. You know, community groups can do with it what they will. Um, policymakers can do with it what they will. At least reduce the imbalance or the information asymmetry where civilians don't know what the police are doing with big data. This is sort of um, um, my way of, of contributing some sort of transparency um, into practices as they're playing out on the ground. Sarah Brain is a assistant professor of sociology at UT Austin and the author of a brand new book called Predict and Surveil. Thank you so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN talking about police departments' use of big data. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.